architecture is really the art and science of turning fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. Hello everyone, this is Vikram Prakash and you are listening to Architecture Talk. Each week we look to have a conversation that advances the frontier of architectural thinking by talking with people from architecture, architectural history and theory, and from a variety of other allied disciplines so that we can learn from them and rethink how we think about architecture. And that is, I hope, certainly the case today as I take on a conversation with my good friend from University of Edinburgh, Richard Williams, who, amongst other things, has written a fascinating book on sex and buildings, which has uh, enraptured me uh, over for quite some time, which I read recently, and which I thought was a great topic to get into very early here in the second season of Architecture Talk. Take a look, take a listen to it, and I hope you enjoy. Okay, well, welcome to Architecture Talk, Richard. Thank you for being here all the way from Edinburgh. It's great to do a transatlantic <laughs> conversation. And, and I am honestly quite um, energized to have this conversation with you because I have just finished reading this uh, exceptional book. And I mean it exceptional in two ways. One, that I've enjoyed and loved reading it. And second is that obviously there aren't many books like this uh, in the marketplace uh, or even in the academy. So Sex and Buildings, Modern Architecture and the Sexual Revolution. Uh, what a fantastic topic. And you would think there would be a lot of books on this. But I note that in the end, you have noted uh, that, and I'm just going to read from page 192 in the conclusion from your book, yeah. where you say, where you're talking, where you're spec, you know, the book starts uh, with your musings on sexuality and architecture, you know, fan the SIAC in the 19th hundreds, Freud, and then you go through a series of chapters, which we will talk about uh, in a minute. But then in the end, you are, you return to the 20, early 21st century. And uh, uh, after quoting Esther Perel and Catherine Hakim, uh, you, you surmise that revolution or not, many of the same basic questions that so exercised Freud and his followers at the beginning of the 20th century still remain at the heart of the 21st. How could, or indeed would, a healthy sexual life be maintained with the boundaries permitted for it in bourgeois society? In some ways, it is surprising, therefore, that architecture has remained so coy on this topic. Yeah. My case studies have been largely states of exception, and you go on from there. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's just a fantastic place for us to start. Uh, sex and buildings, obviously every architectural building, certainly the domestic Ooh. space, must inevitably inscribe sex into it. So why, what, what is, why is architecture and arch more importantly, architectural theory mm. So coy about it. I, what is your thinking? I, I don't know. I still don't know. <laughs> I have to say. I mean, it, you know, it's it, it's funny having this this read back to me after you know it's now five years since the since the book um, appears. And, and I mean, in lots of ways, I I don't think. I think the basic questions are still um, they're still 
correct. I, I think a, a number of things have probably changed. I mean, well, you know, one thing that, that's been very um, live, I suppose, in the last year or so has been the, the um, you know, certain kinds of, yeah, Me Too and certain kinds of identity politics. And I think, you know, that with, with that knowledge, I, I might have um, recast things um, slightly differently. Um, I think, so, you know, something, something else uh, that, that was, you know, is also you know, made me think over the over the past couple of years was was the death of um, Zaha Hadid, and I, I think you know if I was to do the, the the book again, I might you know try and incorporate her material uh, a bit more. I mean, I know the the, the discourse around um, her work was was very much in terms of parametricism. Well, why would you think her work particularly fits into this? Book? No, I mean that's a, that's a, that's a good question. I think it's it's. Um, I think it was the, the sort of the later apartment building. So things like uh, I mean that that big um, uh, complex overlooking the, the the High Line, or there's the there's a some very um, uh, kind of sen sensuous designs for um, hotel rooms in in Madrid. I think I think I might have included that stuff, and just just because it, it seemed, uh, um, I mean, it's obviously not it's not things like the you know the BMW factory or <laughs> that sort of thing, but I thought that you know some of the um, uh, interior designs you know seem to be um, alluding to sex in a in a way that uh, you know mid century Californian modernism seemed to do. I mean, at the same time, mm -hmm. you know, I think you know going back to your your starting point, it, it, it's it was also pretty clear that that nobody was really talking about that. I mean, in 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 interviews then with with her i mean she would she was often asked about you know what it was like to be a, a female architect in a very sort of male dominated profession and you know she she had lots to say about that and then people would talk about her clothes and shoes and you know those those sorts of things but nobody ever really very directly as far as i know you know no, nobody ever really really talked about sex and and yet you know th those uh th there were things in in the Certainly, the the interior designs which, which seem to be worth talking right. about. So, so, I mean, like, so I, I, why why are we so why are we so coy, Richard? I, I, I still don't know. Well, obviously, well, one answer is is that you know the the I mean, I I wrote this you know very much from my own you know extremely um, uh, kind of boring um, perspective, <laughs> where you know in, boring. In, in the, that's not boring. Well, doesn't no, not a term that but, class. You know, clearly that there are parts of the architectural world or the cultural world where it is, um, uh, you know, th there are much more open conversations about sex, and indeed, you know, about sex and buildings. So, you know, what, what one thing that that you know what was in there in the, in the, the, the queer spaces chapter was, uh, you know, there was some discussion about. About you know gay villages and sort of gay zones and cruising and that sort of thing, and we, we've got some right. you know yeah. there's some work going on actually by some colleagues here in in, in Edinburgh that that uh, is is looking at um, looking at, at, at cruising as a as a phenomenon in in the 1970s in in New York and, and other places, and you know there conversations are not coy at all <laughs> you know they have absolutely right. no yeah. now you mentioned that yeah. in fem some feminist theory and queer theory yeah. that there is a much more uh, candid open and engaged discussion on sexuality and space yeah. let's say and, and i think it, you know it, it's it's part of its identity in a way is that is that that candid quality um and I, I suppose, I mean, I was very aware of those discourses. I mean, I think particularly the, the queer stuff, just because, you know, I'm an art historian and, you know, it's, it's, it's absolutely, you know, shot through the, the whole discourse. So I, I was aware of those things and I wanted to sort of inject some of that, that candid quality in, into uh, a discussion of more normative um, architecture and culture. But, you know, I think it just seems to be... Uh, I mean, if my, my colleagues who are on the cruising project, if they were here, they, they would probably say something like, it is just inscribed into straightness, you know, <laughs> that, that, um, uh, that, that sex has to be coy, you know, it has to be sort of hidden or repressed or whatever, you know, that, that is uh, you know, the whole... That's the norm, yes. it's the normative expectation. Yeah, I mean, the whole sort yes. of Western construction of normative sexuality is, is, is uh, you know, that, that it is kept under control or it's, you know, uh, the, there's a whole set of you know, power relations that are, that are inscribed into it. I mean, it's still puzzling, you know, in that I, I think one thing that, that writing the book showed up um, was, 
simply that, that there are other areas of, of you know, mainstream culture which, which seem to be much more comfortable in, in talking about sex. You know, I mean, you can just, you know, go to any news newsstand. Or, or, but but let's, stay, hmm. let's stay with the uh, sort of normative story. Yeah. I mean, so you, your, your chapters are um, the care of the body. Yeah. You begin with the care of the body, where you try and examine kind of the modernist position to a certain extent yeah. uh, on 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 uh, on sexuality, looking mostly, I think, at uh, Lowell and Schindler, yeah. Yeah. Uh, California houses, yeah. Reich, uh, and and I'll come back to this mm. fascinating thing called the organ ah, accumulator. Ah, yes, yes, the organ accumulator. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and then you move to the idea of communal living, mm. uh, where you talk about uh, various sort of, let's say, uh, well, all kinds of things, but like the late hippie kind of California ranch communities yeah. uh, and contrast them and uh, cross pollinate them with collectivist ideas mm. uh, in or lack of them in the Soviet uh, Soviet world, and then the Jewish kibbutz, mm. and then you have a chapter on what you call phallic towers and madmen, yeah. basically talking about, I suppose, mid-century market modernism, yeah. Mies van der Rohe's Seagram building, and a compare and contrast with the figure of Howard Rourke mm. in the Fountainhead. Moving on then from there to what you call porno modernism, a uh, discussion of, um, well, the uh, sort of Hugh Hefner and his kind of identification and invention of a certain kind of a house lifestyle yeah. with uh, uh, with sexual liberation, I guess, from his perspective. Yeah, there's a, there's a weird um, sort of story about that, that chapter in, in that... As I was writing it, actually, um, Beatrice Colomina and uh, Beatrice Preciado were, were doing more or less the same work. <laughs> it was very strange. <laughs> um, and, you know, we were unaware of each other, but uh, it was actually, yes, you know, uh, Beatrice Preciado who'd done, um, uh, I mean, I think she'd, she'd worked with um, Colomina, but, but, but uh, she, she then um, published a book that was very oriented around uh, Hefner and, and Playboy and a all of that stuff and it, um yeah right. interesting yeah. but but you know do you think that there is a kind of a puritanism in modernism in modern architecture i mean you would think that uh coming out of a victorian 19th century mm -hmm. uh that modern architecture would explicitly have in some way reinscribed sexuality and you can look, you know, I suppose you could look at um, Adolf Loos's work and how he, his, the, uh, I guess the difference between his, the bedroom that he made for his own wife in his own house and the very voyeuristic economy of Josephine Baker's house mm -hmm. uh, as an example. But uh, would you describe modernism as being puritanical? <laughs> well, that's that's a very good question. I I, I think at, at a certain level, uh, I I think it is, um, or at least the European version of it is. I mean, what, one thing I realised when I was writing the book was that as soon as you started to use a term like modernism or, or started to talk in generalisations about modernism and whether cultures were puritanical sure, sure. or not, you know, yeah, you could always find examples, you know. Yeah, you know, of course. <laughs> you know, there are vast you know, generalisations exactly. here. I mean. Um, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm very conscious of of that. And then, but and then, you know, people would would then, uh, you know, too late in a way, people would you know, then told me stories about the Bauhaus and uh, and whatever. But th there always seemed to be something. I think I would still hold to the idea that that in in the way that it's uh, it's photographed or the kind of images of of um, of modernism that, that appear in in the journals, the things that are circulated, are still. Um, oddly you know deracinated or you know sort of they're, they're devoid of life um and they're they're devoid of bodies really you know it's very rare to to find 
um, buildings used or inhabited or, or, or lived. So there's something in... in yeah. or, or we just have this healthy body, yes. you know, like kind of... Yeah, this, exactly. Uh, so there, there, is, there is something very strong there. You know, whatever the... You know, whatever's missing from, from the photographs, you know, there's a lot of work that goes into con constructing an image that, that's very clean. Um, and you know, it's saying that you know I, I feel that's a, you know some terrible um, cliche, but it, it's still there, and certainly in the way that, 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 that those those buildings are taught and how the image is often circulated and you know the general stuff. Yeah, it's uh, there's something that, that that represses the the body. You know, there's something. Yes, and at the same time, you know, and clearly there's sexual. Yeah. So the Victorian repression, uh, in a sense continues into the modernist ethos. Uh, and at the same time, one assumes that as in the Victorian period, mm. all the architects who were, let's take Liva, uh, Le Cabousier and Villa mm. Savoie, uh, and then we can shift to Lowell and Schindler, mm. if you like, uh, must at the same time obviously be in... Uh, uh, inscribing a certain kind of sexuality into their buildings. I mean, think of that very uh, uh, display-oriented division sort of site in the in the mm. bathroom uh, of the master bedroom in Villa mm. Savoie. Yeah. Uh, which uh, uh, so I mean, do you have you know? Is there a where do we find inscriptions of the repression of sexuality in the architecture in modernism, early yeah. modernism? It's uh, I mean it's interesting to think about it in relation to um, Victorian or, or 19th century architecture because you know th thinking back at it now, I and mean, I, I I started with uh, um, you know a, a, a sense of you know living in a, in a 19th century city or a largely 19th century city and and, and the division of of uh, private from public space, and you know, of it, of it being a rather re repressive space. But of course, there, there there are lots of different kinds of nineteenth century architecture. And if if uh, you know, you could easily um, have a we could have a conversation where we would uh, perhaps be look, you know looking at the, the exuberant forms of neo baroque decoration or whatever, where there is you know clearly some some um, sexuality that's inscribed. Um, in terms of the um, in the exuberant forms of the decoration yes, exactly, that, of the nineteenth century. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was in the. Give me an example. Uh, I mean, VNA maybe uh, Victorian Albert Museum. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like yeah. Very, All right. There's, there's a on. kind of Sorry, decadence about it. But anyway, I mean, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, how, how would if if we were to work with that idea of of repression, how would it be in, in inscribed in modern architecture? Um, I think it's. You know, I was just looking, looking back at the the, the, the um, California um, chapter, and the there's something about that uh, the, the Neutra house, um, the Silver Lake uh -huh. house, which I'm, you know, I'm sure you've been to, which, which um, yeah. when you you see it in photographs, then you you can imagine it as a as a as a kind of um, you know rather nice open friendly space you know that might be very conducive to um to social life you know of, of whatever kind it, visiting it and then getting a sense of what what Neutra was like <laughs> and what the what the family dynamic right. was like you you have a, a sense of it as being somewhere where there's nowhere to hide you know it's actually an incredibly controlling space and, and i think that that in um in in modernism, if we were to, you know, if we were to try and look for things that are, you know, oddly repressive, it, it would be in, in that, that sense of uh, control and, uh, you know, how transparency and, and openness can be um, means of, of control and, and discipline as, as much as they are um, ways of opening opening things up. Um, so. And, and making things voyeuristic. I mean, isn't transparency simply an alibi for voyeurism? I, a, a lot of the time, it, it is. I suppose it depends on the it depends on the house. I mean, I, I started out with with you know, a rather simplistic notion that that uh, 
transparency was all about voy voyeurism. Uh, and then mm -hmm. in the end, I, I, I ended up with something that was a bit more uh, paranoid in a way that it was really much, much <laughs> less about sex and much more about control. So I, I don't know whether that was just me getting older or, or um, whatever. I mean, but, but I think the, the, um, those ga games. I mean, those things are completely hmm. symptomatic, Richard, are they hmm. not? I mean, control hmm. and voyeurism hmm. are both sexual uh, 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 yeah. affects. Well, that's that's right. I mean, I, I think uh, you know clearly. We, you know, over the past few years, we've become uh, you know everybody's become much more attuned to to the the relationship between sex and power. I mean, obviously, you know, they were always related, but the, you know, that so much of the the, the conversation um, the, the last few years has been has been about that. And yeah, it's 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 there in the in the architecture. Um, I think what what maybe um, is uh, you know, has has become clearer is is, is how those, those things are really not innocent, um, and that the, there are, uh, you know, it, it's it, it's easy to 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 approach something like you know Californian mid century modernism with you know uh, perhaps seeing it as a you know more humanized or you know, friendlier version of 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 modernism, but it, actually it, it seems to inscribe all of the the um, uh, all all of the the questions of of um, power and control and discipline that are that are there everywhere, you know. <laughs> um, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But you, at the same time, you were weren't happy with the more sort of uh, sexually positive uh, uh, social and experiments, mm -hmm. such as the communal living. Uh, yeah. cities uh, of California or, or communes like uh, Olympali yeah. Ranch or Drop City. Yeah, Drop City. I mean, but I found these these things fascinating, like, absolutely fascinating. And, and uh, the, you know, I, yeah. you know, what they one are. of the one of the things about the book was was being sort of simultaneously, you know, drawn to things or, you know, fascinated by them without necessarily um, you know, being able to imagine participating in them. And I, I think the 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 um, the commune chapter was really, uh, it, it yeah I, I felt very uh, conflicted about about that one because you know on the one hand uh, there was something immensely appealing about it and then on the other hand there was you know clearly uh, there were there were things that went badly wrong <laughs> there were uh, you know in Drop City there there were certainly. Uh, elements of of uh, of a more you know really rather sort of traditional and, and repressive sexuality that that seemed to be followed through and kept carried on um and the, there was in one of the communes that i mentioned that there's the uh there's an account of the the, the phantom fucker if we can say that i think this is at the morning morning right at the morning midnight star visitor, ranch yes. yes the midnight visitor uh, but you know in in this this yeah. account which was clearly meant to be funny you know that the, uh, you know, almost everybody had been had been visited by this 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 character, and clearly, you know, what was being described was a, you know, what what we might we might now describe as as rape, maybe, but you know, there there was something uh, something slightly disturbing about reading accounts um, like that, uh, and also, um, but, but you seem to back off mm -hmm. very quickly from the the fascination with yeah. these sites um, in the text. Yeah. Uh, uh, and and you and you you've identified a critical, I think, uh, 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 mm. unease yeah. with the topic, which is what you the way you started to describe this uh, the the communal yeah. living section, which is both fascinating, and yet uh, you could never imagine yeah. participating. I mean, in a way, that's that, that's true true of a number of things that I described. I mean, I I felt with um, the co communal living thing. Um, I mean, I suppose it, if it had been a different kind of book, if it had been a, uh, a more anthropological book, what I would have had to have done would have been to go and live in, in a commune, you know, and uh, and that, that wasn't really on the cards, um, you know, if I'd had longer or, you know, if I'd been you know, in, in a different life, yeah, that, that might have been possible. I mean, there was, I should say that there, there are certainly... Um, uh, there were things on on the edge of of that that, that I had 
or have experienced and and uh so when I just well we, we, like before i was um uh before as a student even i i uh I, I had um, friends who were involved with the, the free festival uh, movement in in, uh, mm-hmm. in Britain, and we, which was basically, you know, a, a kind of a, a narco. Um, uh, how, to, how to describe those sort of a, a narco punks who uh, organised free festivals all, all over, mostly the south of England, but but um, Stonehenge was a famous one. And so, you know, I, I went to a bunch of these festivals. They right. were completely, you know league or whatever um and you know i I, and i I remember sort of feeling you know something of that uh you know being conflicted about these these things you know on on the one hand uh, there was something enormously attractive about them you know people just do what they want the music was great uh there was you know they, they were fantastic parties but um they they were also um i remember you know being being struck by kind of how destructive they were and how how kind of lawless they were and and um the uh the um yeah there are there are aspects of that that were quite destructive in the sense that destructive to architecture and space and law and order or destructive to people's identity oh i mean i mean literally physically destructive so i mean the i mean I remember the stonehenge right. festival which was 84 um, the last time it was on properly, and I, I, I went to that. It was, uh, I mean, it was like being in a war zone, really. And the, the, uh, there's, yeah, I mean, there's really? this sort of you know, great convoy of buses that you know wound up close to the the stones. There were police everywhere on the perimeter of the site, and there, there were um, the the RAF, you know, the the Air Force. They were they were buzzing the site, um, and there were the, the nearest. Um, they're yeah. policing the whole uh, place. Obviously. Yeah, I mean, it was um, it was a kind of lawless um, zone. It was it was very very interesting, you know. But it, it was a bit, you know, I was like seventeen, eighteen or something, and you know, it, it was a you know the first time I'd, I'd encountered um, something that really seemed to be completely outside of the the, the law. Um, it, it, yeah, I mean, the West Coast in America, you know, does certainly seem to carry yeah. the torch for the questioning of these yeah. sites. I mean, you can think even from the kind of busting up of hotels by uh, Led Zeppelin or whoever to the formation of, uh, uh, you know, various of these uh, communal living communities in the Bay Area, even yeah. in LA, and uh, certainly up in Oregon and um, yeah. even here in Seattle. Uh, versus the more buttoned up um, uh, sublimated uh, sexuality of the architecture of kind of transparency uh, of the East Coast, um, of the kind you begin to, I think, discuss in the ta- chapter on yeah. phallic towers. Yeah. With Mises Thoreau. Yes, I mean, it, it's... Uh, it, it, yeah, I'm just, that's, that's, well, we'll come on to that in a second. I mean, I was the other um, instance of... Uh, communal living that, that I had some experience of was um, in uh, in the mid-1980s. So when, it, when I was a student in, in London, I, I went to um, Goldsmiths, to the, uh, basically to, to art school. And um, at that point in London, uh-huh. an, an enormous amount of the... Uh, of the, the um, social housing there was squatted. Uh, so I, I was a... Yeah, I was a squatter oh, for about right? a year. Um, and that that was very interesting. Uh-huh. So, I think maybe you know something like thirty thirty five percent of the um, the housing stock, the the public housing stock, was squatted at that point, and it was you know a complete kind of market and, and governmental failure. And there, there wasn't a quite extraordinary culture that that uh, developed a, around that. Um, and it, it was very very interesting, you know. And there were there were elements about it that were very attractive because we're you know, we weren't just um, squatting houses, but also things like, you know, old cinemas and, and um, there were all kinds of social events that were going on and gigs and, and, and whatever. Very, very, very interesting. It was also the, the thing uh-huh. that, that we, you know, was also kind of difficult about it was was the fact that in, in this this sort of, you know, quasi lawless zone, the, the, uh, the, the, the people who survived the best in a way were the, they were the, the, the toughest and often you know the physically physically the toughest so uh it, it was um yeah it became a um 
you 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 had to be tough you know <laughs> no, but why are you bring this example up in the context of the sexual um uh liberation hmm. and oh, oh i think just um because uh it, it was you know it was a, it was a good example of where you know space where lots of different things were being tried out so uh and uh-huh. you know, clearly you know sexuality was part of that but it, it was um you know it was a good example of uh, of a culture where, which was you know certainly a, a, a set in opposition to the to the mainstream right and in the end you also brought back the yeah. occupy culture yeah. of the 2000s but I, I and just let this spend one more yeah. minute on the 1990s so i mean in my experience and memory of the 1990s it was the post uh, uh yeah. hiv world yeah. where everything was uh, uh extremely uh, uh prohibited and yeah. fear yeah yes i no i i yeah. i think that's um I think that's right, and I, I think there was um, certainly what you know. One thing that I remember from that that period as as well was something you know quite quite a puritanical culture, sort of a, 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 oddly yes, puritanical. Absolutely. And then, then um, I think it, the the way that it it became interesting again was you know very e- exemplified in mainstream. Cultures. I mean, you you know, you mentioned the, the the phallic towers chapter. Well, one of the things that got me into that, you know, apart from the you know the the the, the obvious architecture uh, architectural references, but it was the the um, the TV series Mad Men. So that was, you know, I, which I you know. Yes, yes, yeah, oh, yes. I watched too. the whole it, series. It was you yeah, know six fifties, sixties modernism and, and, and yeah, and Don Draper. It, it, Drink yeah. triple martinis and uh, yeah. having sex everywhere. So, is there an identification between fifties modernism and kind of this uh, non-suburban male? I, I was, I was very, very interested in that as an idea. I mean, it, it seemed that what what Madman was doing, you know, or, albeit in a you know, complete fantasy world, was it, it was it was writing something that that couldn't have been re- reported in in the you know the, the the photographs or the you know it wasn't there in the um uh in, in the representations of those those buildings in in um uh in, in the architecture journals it was doing something that in in sense was at that perhaps at the level of of gossip or hearsay or you know bits of you know fragments of of conversations you know uh, uh, and there was something that was maybe known about that world that was then elaborated. Um, I, I thought it was very clever. You know, it, it was. I mean, the the the, uh, the 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 acting in a way got you know, it, the, the plot lines became rather wooden, but as a as a spectacle, it was amazing. I mean, the the architecture was um, uh, the, that in, interior architecture was was beautifully done. It was really incredible, incredible. in the way that it, it yeah. sort of drew. It described a, a landscape of, the, of, of incredible, incredibly rigid divisions between male and female, and you know power relations there, and then you know all sorts of problems of people who tried to you know, transgress those things. Um, no, I, I thought it was a remarkable piece right. of work. Uh, probably went. To, you do, you managed all sixty episodes, did you? I, I'm not sure I got that far. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I think I saw them all. Yes, and they yeah. all end in California. You remember exactly. Don Draper yeah. heads to California and joins a yep. meditation yep. commune. So, thinking about the writer's conception of where this all yep. all, all finishes up yep. uh, is there. Uh, but but let's spend one minute more on that uh, on this idea that uh, the 1950s and 60s steel and glass mm. skyscraper with its uh, sort of slick modernist uh, transparency mm. driven interiors is uh, actually a sexualized space of a particular kind with very strict uh, mm. hierarchy of course uh and that's contained and described uh, uh, 
in the relationship between Don Draper and his yeah. uh, and his first wife, uh, and then the Canadian yeah. supermodel he marries uh, mm. and her move to California. As the uh, way I read all that yeah. is kind of like a shift uh, that takes place, and. Uh, with the with the jet mm. plane invention of the jet plane as kind of uh, the car and the jet plane as the instruments that enable i guess essentially yeah. the male to move yeah. from one place to the other but in the figure of uh, i don't i've forgotten what his sort of uh, yeah uh, so second life's name is. <laughs> but you know uh, it, it's it's interesting a that it reads the Misian office space mm. in this mm. very specific. I, I I was really fascinated by that because it it was so different to the way that you you receive those buildings, you know, in you know art school or architecture school right. or whatever. Right. You know, yeah, you're, yeah, you're yeah. presented Absolutely. with these these images. I yeah. mean, I you know, I'm an art historian, so you know, I'm always thinking about about images as much as I'm, you know, actual buildings, but you, you receive those images as, as sort of very clean right. and ordered and super modern and, you know, very, very sort of masculine, uh, efficient, rational, all of that stuff. And then as you don't have to do very much to them and you, you start to understand them as, as something else in, entirely. And, and I think that it's, um, you can certainly understand them. Uh, I, mean, I, know, I think I, I talked about this in the book. You'd understand them as as being very masculine spaces. So you know, having the same qualities as you know, finely cut clothes and and you know, a Mercedes Benz or a, you know, something something nicely made like that. You know, the the sorts of um, uh, props that that Freud talks about. You know, pipes and coats and and you know, all this sort of robust, strong signifiers of masculinity. You can certainly understand that. that. And it was that, that, that sort of tipping into uh, actual depictions of, of sex, you know, actual behaviour in, in the offices. And, uh, yeah, it was, it, was, um, it was fascinating. And then, you, you know, of course, uh, you know, once, once you've kind of got that, then you realise that there are lots of ways that that um, landscape was being hinted at. Uh, that that these these buildings um, were you know, understood in all sorts of ways, but in, in a rather kind of coded way. So that there was, um, you know, is that book that's mm -hmm, mm -hmm. sex right. in the um, sex in not the that no no um, yep. sex in the single girl, of course. I mean, there's and the uh, uh -huh. I think it's like early early sixties. Um, uh, kind of uh, a sort of advice manual for, for for young women working in in um, you know, oh right 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 uh, mm -hmm. and you know there's lots of stuff like that and and um, the, the development of uh, advice in, in women's magazines and so on and that, so it, it, there was something about Mad Men that 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 brought all of that that stuff to life and it started to to fill in some of the gaps. That's fascinating reading, uh, Richard. This is probably a good time for us to take a break. We are talking to Richard Williams. And we are discussing the implications of his book, Sex and Buildings, Modern Architecture and the Sexual Revolution. Hello, everyone. Thanks for listening to Architecture Talk. This is a self-supported podcast based on an initial grant from the GAHTC. For more information about GAHTC, please visit GAHTC.org. We release a new conversation every other Wednesday. So, if you are enjoying this conversation, please do be sure to visit our website and to check out some of the earlier conversations. From the website, you can also subscribe to this podcast and you can listen to the other episodes. You can also simply directly subscribe to us via Spotify or via the podcast app on your iPhone. And of course, we are listen, available to be listened and of course, we are available to be heard via any of the other podcasting apps that are available on the internet, such as Stitcher, Overcast, etc. We would also love to hear from you if you have any questions or just some comments, or even have a suggestion for a future episode. You can reach us via the contacts page on architecturetalk.org. Thank you for listening again.
Well, welcome back. We are talking to Richard Williams and we are discussing his book, Sex and Buildings, uh, published about five years ago, but only now <laughs> reaching my desk. Uh, uh, so, Richard, if I may mm. put you on the spot, you begin the book by noting uh, that you sort of started to think about this topic in the middle of, of one might what one might describe as a typical mid-career uh, identity <laughs> yes. crisis. This was the, 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 the bit of the book that, that got, it got a lot of attention right at the beginning. I mean, oh, yeah. It no, did. I mean, and, and I think a lot of people just read the first two pages and either put it down, uh, you know, in disgust <laughs> or uh you know although then they did they did read it but it, it got it no that that was definitely a, a kind of hook i i feel <laughs> would i would i write that again i i don't know i don't know there was um i, I mean there, there's a story you... behind it in that uh you know first of all a, a straightforward publishing story in it that um reaction the um publisher I'd been working with um, actually for some years that they they um, they'd seen the first draft and then they they came back and they said you know this is all very nice but you know can, can you make this is a book about sex you know can you make it more <laughs> more sexy and um, and, that, and that, that in a way is what <laughs> happened but I think I did but but I one thing I would say about it is that um, the you know what, what I was trying to articulate there in, in a very kind of clumsy way was that you know, the, the, this was not a an academic um, issue. This was not, um, uh, you know, something that was a you know a rather abstract interest. But I, it, it was it, it was something that I, I felt actually came out of um, kind of lived experience. And you know, and a, you know, kind of classic experience of sure. you know of, of, of reaching a certain point and having a certain kind of stability with family and whatever. And you're you, you know, you're, you're starting to sort of think, you know, is this is this it? <laughs> um, and uh, right, right, and the, right. the, I remember, you, you know, feeling some or attributing, a, you know, a lot of that to the built environment. So uh, thinking that, you know, I was in this this you know beautiful city, uh, you know, good university, you know, good job, all, all the rest of it. But the environment itself was somehow. Uh, I, I, I felt was very controlling. I mean, I think, you know, in, in the conclusion, I think I, you know, say something like, you know, in, in the end, I, 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 you know, I realized that, you know, all the environments are, are controlling in some way, but I, I know, I certainly felt those things very strongly, you know, and there, there was definitely a, a sense when I, when I first started thinking about the topic was, it was to do with, with feeling, uh, you know, some sort of entrapment, you know, in, in so, I mean, the, these are right. problems of, luxury in a way i mean I, uh, this is no i understand mm. that no but there are problems of luxury but they are also uh, kind of uh, uh, fundamental yeah. problems in the sense that sex and sexuality is is a, a, a universal yeah. issue and, and in, I, you know in I, that sense I, and and you end since you by saying that uh, you, with the hope and aspiration that, uh, you know, not much has changed mm. in your neighborhood, but you hope for a continual uh, uh, effort at mm. utopian thought. Architecture can't coerce people into different lives, but it can provide images of what those lives yeah. might be like. Mm. And, I, and, and I took that as uh, the driving force behind your effort to go and look at the, you know, Schindler houses and the Neutra houses, and then to look mm. at all the communes on the West mm. Coast, and then uh, turn towards um, uh, a perusal of old <laughs> playboys, and and uh, mm. and and then uh, read figures uh, in the in the Fountainhead. Uh, but in the end, I got the sense that, you know, yeah. you were disappointed. Well, I, I think, um, I mean, my starting point was, uh, you know, re really uh, before I'd read too much ab about the, the problem. But, my, you know, I, I knew Freud. I mean, and I, I'd, I, I'd always been fascinated by the figure of, of Vienna in, in that, uh, that work, you know, uh -huh. 
Vienna, the Vienna city, you know, and, and, and uh, those... the, the, the idea that this, yeah. um, he's describing a, a, a landscape of, you know, it's not anywhere, although, you know, there's a universalizing quality about it, but, you know, Vienna, the 19th century bourgeois city is, is very, very strongly present. Yeah, yeah, sure. And, you know, I, I, I felt, you know, Edinburgh actually had a lot of those qualities. I, do, I still you know, think it does. <laughs> um, sure. And it, <laughs> uh, so that I, I, you know, my starting point in, in a crude way was was that, well, you know, could, could there be, um, you know, uh, could there be liberation in some form? You know, could there be a, a non-repressive way of being in the world? I think wh- where I ended up through, and doing a lot of reading and then lo- looking at stuff was was a something that's much closer closer to the the you know Michel Foucault's um, uh, account of sexuality where you you, you understand that uh, Foucault who's, who's account again? Michel Foucault uh, where you, Foucault, you understand yeah. sexuality yeah. as something that is it, it's biological but it, it's really the, it's the interaction of the biological and the social and it, you know it, it is. Uh, the repression is really a, it's a hypothesis or it's a myth rather not a hypothesis um, that it, it's uh, right. it's something that, that, that gets produced as an idea in, in certain circumstances but, but actually um, sexuality is, is something that is, is socially produced and you know sometimes it, you know, it may have very florid um, um, uh, Manifestations, and other times, not 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 at all. Um, so, so I ended up with you know a view that's much more like that. Um, you know, having started with, with a a much more kind of biological view. <laughs> um, sure. uh, so, so yeah. I really moved from the yeah. biological to the social, and I think you know it's partly just through having read a lot more and you know got a bit older and uh, and looked at a lot of things. And I, and I I I do you know now you know looking back at the the whole. Projects and having written a little bit more about about um, about the, the topic, I, I think that I, I would um, subscribe to that uh, much more. But you know, still, still kind of fascinated by the idea of liberation. Um, I, I, it, it's uh, yes. And I think that one thing that's encouraging uh, in the, you know really very very recently, but uh, it, it's um, I think people have started to, to talk and, and think about housing a lot more, at least in you know the the kind of you know, rich, rich world that, that I inhabit. Uh, and it's you know, and and yes. Hayden, you talk about Dolores Hayden, then that's interesting. Yeah, um, very interesting um, bit, bit of work that, and you know her her, her work on um, co housing uh, was. I mean, it's, it's quite a dry piece, but I mean, it's extremely suggestive, and, it, and it's it's interesting how, you know, even um, in, in at the moment, in you know, in, even in places like like the UK, there, there's an increasing talk about about co housing or co co living solutions. You know, th- things that look much more, uh, uh, you know, at least they start to break down the um, the the. Um, uh, the conventions of, of housing a little bit. I mean, you know, maybe some of these things. Are... And, and the inscription of the, a certain yeah. kind of a nuclear family, mm. I think, is that the critique with its uh, expectations of a certain yeah. kind of... Um, no, um, I, I think that's right. And, I, I, it... and by liberation here, we are talking about, yeah. you know, sexual liberation as kind of a, a key indicator of a transformation. Yeah, yes, I think so. Exactly. Although I, I think um, one of the, the, the things that has certainly been happening with housing around um, co-living is is the production of a new market sector, which you know, clearly is, is going to enable over the next um, few years in, in you know, big cities here, and I, I'm sure in the US as well, it, it'll enable uh, young, youngish people to, to live together in you know, non-nuclear family. Um, settings. I mean, all, all of that seems to be positive. Mm-hmm. On, on the other hand, uh, it, it does seem that, that that people are now working so hard that they really have no time for, for any kind of, well, um, uh, you know, that the sexual liberation does seem to be off off the the agenda all, all, altogether at the moment. But uh, okay, mm-hmm. so let's take this opportunity to also. Uh, I mm-hmm. mean, you picked up Vienna and Edinburgh. Uh, and sort of uh, uh, yeah. put them down together. But you do have a section in your book, a little section in your book, but I know from some of your other writing 
uh, your interest in looking at other sites oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, like Brazil. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, you know, you looked at the love hotels in uh, Tokyo in Japan as uh, possible sites of uh, alternative, I guess, um, yeah. sexual sociality. I mean, I think um, the, I've done, uh, I suppose, quite a lot of work over, over the years on, on places that are really the complete opposite of the 19th century European city. So, you know, Los Angeles is a place that I've you know, very often been to and you know, I, like, I like a lot. And, um, yeah. and there was, I did this big as you know, you know where where we first started talking, you know, there's this big chunk of work on Brazil, and again, I think uh, the the way that, right. that Brazilian cities were um, talking about themselves, and you know the, the, some of the wilder architecture they were building in the in the 50s and 60s, did seem to um, uh, at least provide an image of a, a, a different kind of life. Um, and I, I met Oscar Niemeyer before before he, he died. I mean, he, he must have been, you know, about 110 uh-huh. or something. <laughs> God. Yeah, um, yeah. And, he, you know, he... It, yeah. <laughs> As is I am Bay, by the way, he's 110. Yeah, I mean, it, it's obviously it's a good profession. You know, you're in the right profession. Uh, you, you'll, you'll live forever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. And, the, it, you know, a certain kind of... Uh, you know, quite quite sort of normative sexuality was was a you know, big part of what what Nehemiah was was about and what what he was he was doing. You know, he, well, what did he, t- what no, he, he the way that he talked that? about his buildings, he he would say, oh well, you know, I, in the morning I um, you know I, I just I do a few sketches and then I, you know, I like to go down to the beach and you know draw the girls or whatever. <laughs> and you know, his whole life seemed to uh, yeah, he, he yeah. cultivated this idea of of. Um, just you know, hanging out on the beach and you know, meeting girls, and you know, the, uh, and and obviously there are those there are famous drawings of of buildings where they're they're you know he equates them very directly or the, uh, to to the female form or whatever. Right. So, um, and the, the, you know, yeah, which is also true of Corbusier. Well, there's obviously and some a lot of overlap there, and you know, Corbusier. Uh, um, and I wrote about this in the, in the Brazil book, you know, the, before which, um, where I mean, Corbusier just becomes completely entranced by Brazil and disappears for a while, and uh, you know, his, his, his architecture takes on right, a very kind right. of sexualized um, turn. And it, it, it clearly, you know, all, all of these these people, I mean, Corbusier and Niemeyer and all the other Brazilians of that generation, they they were they were trading in, in myth fantasies and, and whatever but it, it, it was very interesting how they they consciously wanted to um I- inject that into their kind of modernism of course i mean they were doing that at the same time as other other brazilian architects like kervin and other Archigas were, were um doing you know things which were you know really not about that at all i mean they were about politics and struggle and class you know social class and of course. um but le- but let's stay with that for one second. I mean, you know, our big figures of architecture uh, are dominated by a certain masculinity and with yep. masculinity, normative uh, sexuality. Yep. You know, Corbusier, Niemeyer, even Frank Lloyd Wright, Mies van der Rohe. Mm. You know, you can go down that line. Um, yeah. And Louis Kahn. I suppose with the the fantastic uh, the, yeah uh, film that is an amazing son. film my my architect ah, extraordinary mm. yes I mean there is this uh, I mean the figure of the architect as invented by mm. these quote unquote master figures and idealized as for instance in mm. the person of Howard Rourke uh, mm. in both in the film and the book. Uh, as a kind mm. of an aggressive male figure is not a figure mm. that seems to have yeah. gone away even today. Okay? I mean, I don't think no. there has been any shift on that uh, looking up and down uh, the yeah. pantheon of no, our it's, it's very strongly present there, isn't it? And, and it's in the, 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 the look of architecture um, studios of the, the the offices of the big firms. It's um, it's it's there in the way that the architects like to um, 
have themselves photographed and present themselves to the public. I mean, it, yeah, it, it, it seems, uh, I mean, in a way, I think it's probably why I, I didn't become an architect. <laughs> it's, uh, um, yeah, um, you know, it's very, uh, very curious um, thing. Um, yeah, and, and, and it remains unquestioned. I mean, uh, uh, it, it's amazing to me that... Uh, that this isn't a stronger discourse. Yeah. I mean, even it's, I, I think since the, the book was published, it, it, it has become, uh, you know, a significantly stronger uh, line of, of questioning. I, mean, I, I went about eighteen months ago. I went to a, a conference in Stockholm, which was the uh, it's the European it's the Architectural um, Humanities Research Association, which is a you know, sizable conference, and that that was really all about this question so it was all about you know architecture and, and gender it was called actually it was called Ar architectures feminisms um and yeah i mean it, it you know th there mm. was there was a lot of work there that, that that made me think um yeah you you would have written a different book now but i mean clearly they, they were the organizers of the conference were, were writing and and thinking very much in in uh in opposition to what they you know they saw as a mainstream culture and, and architecture being a particular problem um and yeah right i mean i mean we are we, we consider ourselves to be a you know at least academically uh, or even in general yeah. a, a a very progressive liberal profession yeah. where we are all over sustainability yeah. we are all about ecology we are all about yeah. social society, social housing, equality, yeah. social justice, you name it. But somehow, I don't think feminism or 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 uh, or, or no, has I mean, seems to have made a it, big it dent. It is a very noticeable difference be between architecture and, and art history. So I mean, I, you know, I've always lived in the art history world. I mean, for 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 better or worse, you know, it's it's a funny old uh -huh. discipline, but. Uh, what, a very striking difference there is the fact that right. um, gender, gender politics, um, feminisms of different kinds are absolutely core to the curriculum. So uh, you know, e even you know, us, we're we're a sort of we're a big department. We're um, you know, lots of people doing different stuff. But I mean, most people have got some kind of interest in in the body, you know, as a as a. a an idea or, or, or a problem Correct. and then in terms of the um uh just as, as a professional organization we we are i would i would think about you know three quarters female now i, I think um so it's something like that so it's it it's mm -hmm. almost the, the exact opposite almost the exact opposite and e even though we, you know we have um it's yeah. interesting to see that actually played out in architectural history so um although you know we, we you know i'm Basically, an architectural historian in, in lots of ways, but you know, I inhabit the art history world. Um, but uh, but you do see that those those um, uh, sort of uh, gender patterns um, played out in, in 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 the architectural history world. So yeah, our architectural historians are mostly men, you know? <laughs> even though they they do basically the same thing as the as the architectural historians. Um, yeah, no, it's curious. Yeah, if we move towards the end, I do want to come back to um, James Bond. Uh, uh, if there is an archetypical mm. masculine image that parallels uh, or and certainly eclipses the mm. Harvard mm. Rourke of Fountainhead, it would be Mr. Bond. And 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 I'm fascinated by your discussion yes. of the what is yeah. it it's the uh, Lautner's uh... yeah the Sheets Goldstein House that's that that's that's the one uh, up in the Hollywood Hollywood Hills which I think um, LACMA now own uh, the, there's the other one uh, which oh. I've now forgotten the name of uh, but the, the one in Palm Springs is the one that's in the Bond film. Uh, so the, the Sheets Goldstein, right. Elrod House, that's it, Elrod, right, right. 1968. That's the one that's in the Bond film. Um, yeah, so there's, there's two two houses. Yeah, they, okay. they were fantastic to um, visit, both of them, extraordinary house. Why were they fantastic? Uh, yeah, <laughs> why were they fantastic? Well, uh, kind of uh, just um, 
in spatially they they were quite extraordinary both of them and they they had uh the most surprising um spaces uh they were totally baroque you know you couldn't you you would sort of en enter and you could just didn't know what what you were going to experience you you and then suddenly you you enter through some very sort of small and discreet entrance and then the house would kind of explode into you know in the sheets goldstein case that that's uh, it would ex it's all, all organized around a, an enormous um, pool and then the the um elrod house has this gigantic um circular um, living space i mean they're they're Spatially, they're, they're extraordinary. Then, in in material terms, they're they're also extraordinary. So there, there's a kind of richness with of the materials of, of the surfaces. Um, they're yeah, just consistently um, surprising, um, funny houses. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I mean, what jumps out for me is that yeah. always it seems like the villains yeah. who seem to have yes. modernist houses. Yeah. I assume that the villains are all, you know, sexually you know, promiscuous. You know, and... Goldfinger, the the um the Bond book. I mean, originally Ian Fleming's book. The, the Ian Fleming uh, modelled yeah. Goldfinger, yeah. the great villain, on the architect Goldfinger. I'm sure you know that that story. Yeah, so, yeah. Erno Goldfinger. Yeah, that's where he got the name from. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> I, I think he he liked the idea that Goldfinger, the architect, was this. You know, mysterious Middle European immigrant, and who, who, an extremely who, polite and well-spoken and uh, uh, suave, yes, but at the same like time, that. an absolute <laughs> villain. Yeah. Less yeah. villain who uses architectural mm. contraptions to mm. get rid of yeah. uh, of people right. like trapdoors and things like that. And and I also think of you yeah. know the entire visual staging of the Star Wars uh, series, the original, where you know the entire empire has yeah. exquisite yeah. modernist architecture, shit, and it's staging. Whereas the yes. the rebel forces look like Lego. No, uh, those those right. things are, are they're important, <laughs> aren't they? Um, uh, and why is it that you know the villains get identified with exquisite modernism? I, 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 I don't know. Um, I suppose may, maybe um, you know in in the, the popular conversation around architecture, then it, it's easy to see modernism as as exemplifying control and discipline and uh, I don't know th things that are maybe uh, kind of coercion, um, th things that are easily associated with with um, villainous behaviour. <laughs> and then, you know, I guess well, this would be another conversation. But the, the there was in, enough in in the popular domain by the fifties uh, about architects being eccentric and controlling. I mean, uh, my sense in some conversations here in the United States is that architects have the reputation of being, you know suave sophisticated always with a different point of view um and you know the figures who yeah. stand around immaculately dressed yeah. at parties with cigars in their hands. well it hasn't hasn't changed i've just been to the venice biennale you know the uh, the, the architecture biennale and of course it's yes it's, uh -huh. it, it, it was james bond really it's like like a like a like a james bond film yeah the Biennale was James Bond. <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, thank you for being on Architecture Talk, Richard. But a re real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much for listening to Architecture Talk. This is Vikram Prakash. I am the host of the show, and our show's producer is Elizabeth Ambenhauer. If you like the show, please do remember to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And also, take a moment and rate us on iTunes. Thank you very much, and see you next time. <laughs>